Lord, we love you, Lord. We praise you, God. All oh, that's within us. There's nothing worth more. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. And I've tasted and seen the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free, and my shame is enough, in your presence, Lord, Holy Spirit, Holy Great is 
above, Lord, all the trials we face, Lord, all the things, God, that try to come at us, Lord, you have seated us above with Christ in heavenly places, and Lord, every eye will see, God, but let us see you this morning, God, even now, God, even this morning, Lord, that we would fix our eyes on you, we fix our eyes on you this morning. Fix our eyes on you.
Lord, we love you. God bless this time. Bless the word that's coming forth from our brother Blake. Give you all the glory, all the praise. Amen.
you know, so anyway, I just shared with you guys that it's the same grace. Uh, before I go in briefly for the next, you know, 20 minutes or so about um, compassion and identity and striving and obligation, revival in the river. If you come Friday, all you literally have to do is say, I'm with Abel. That's, that's pretty much your kicking in. Uh, you don't have to stand in the line, come down to the back gate, uh, and that's where all the volunteers are coming through. If you are volunteering for the event, like if you're on a volunteer list, set up crew, uh, pat with the table, uh, try to be there 4.30, 5 o'clock-ish. Uh, people will start lining up as early as 5.15. The gates are gonna open at 6, 6.15. We may kick the event off as early as 6.30, depending on if we have 1,500 people standing out there. But if you come to the event before it starts, now when it starts, it's gonna be crazy. You still come around down to that backstage area. Uh, it's on the left side if you're looking at the amphitheater, but it's gonna be a, it's gonna be like ants running around. If you get there before the gates open, it'll be a lot smoother transition. So how many of you guys are planning on coming? Amen. So just come down to the back side of the gate. Say, I'm here with Abel. Uh, that's pretty much all you got to say. All right. If you're volunteering, be there, uh, you know, as early as 430. If you're not volunteering, come into the back gate and then just find a seat and enjoy yourself. If you want to help, like if you're just sitting around and you're like, man, I just want to serve, by all means, just get with somebody who has a, a black uh, Revival in the River shirt on and say, hey, I'll, I'd love to help. Where can I help? They may say, we're good, enjoy the event, or hey, can you take this trash to the dumpster? All right? So we're Revival in the River. It's here. Back. Yeah. Going down. And then we're going down. To sleep. To sleep. So Chris texted me, uh, me and Brandon called Josh yesterday. We come out here to get a halo light. And he was like, yeah, do worship and, and talk. Like, great. We we love that. We would be we'd be sitting in our room or our house at home right now with Jesus, so uh come fellowship with you guys is even better. I can't be loud in my living room. Uh, I got this worship music going like real close to my phone and my kids are sleeping, but um we came out here to get a halo light. But man, it's just it's just so good always to come out here. And Chris texted me yesterday when I told him I was coming, and he said, you guys have been on, like, um, outreach out of a place of compassion and identity versus striving and obligation. Um, how many of you feel like sometimes your walk with the Lord or your ministry aspirations or your marriage or whatever, you find yourself sometimes in a place of striving? Yes, it's, like hard. You're, it's hard. Like, yeah. you're just yeah. you're plowing through. There's not enough time in the day. Amen. You had an idea to do this, and then work started and now the idea is you know six months old and uh, you're still working and yeah, come on. so we get it man uh, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit compassion um, so when it comes to outreach and evangelism if you guys have been on that um, you have to couple it with prayer and Chris mentioned that that you guys have been talking about intercession like everything everything we do as Christians is birthed out of abiding like you have to to abide. Every every big movement that came out of the Christian culture or every thing that is that has been momentous in the kingdom of God was birthed out of prayer. You know, like Abel will go on and abide after Josh is gone, after Chris is gone. Like this place will still go on, right? Because it was birthed in abiding. You see what I'm saying? Like Teen Challenge is going on even after David Wilkinson's been dead for 15, 20 years because it was birthed in the place of abiding. Jesus' ministry, 2,023 years old, is still going because it's still abiding. Like he's still making disciples, right? Because it's still abiding. And so everything that we do has to be coupled with prayer. Now, prayer is like Cinderella. You know, she's like the last, nobody really wants to dance with her. You know what I mean? Until you get in there with her. Right. And you see, man, she's the prettiest one of all of them, and, and we have a prayer room at Take the City, and Brandon wrote a blog, I believe it was you, and it was called Empty Rooms. Like all of our worship sets, our, our leaders who come in to lead these hour long, hour and a half long, two hour long prayer sets, it's always to an empty room, right? It's funny, we, we, I talk, we look at it all the time. We do an outreach, a revival on the river, pack it out. <coughs> Love and kindness, pack it out. 
It's got singing in it. It's going to be packed out. <laughs> it's got a quiet room with just some soft instrumental and you have to pray. It's going to be, yeah. I got uh, I got it. But Lord, I got to bury my father. You know, <laughs> let the dead bury the spirit. So prayer is the place. But once you enter into that place and you find the sweet spot of intercession where you really begin to now have faith that God does speak to you. You know, how many of you know God speaks? Like he, and he can be quite talkative. And there's sometimes where he'll just look at you and you can read his facial expressions, you know, and, but everything that we do, as far as outreach goes, in compassion and striving versus obligation and identity and compassion, it's all got to be rooted in prayer, right? Uh, Matthew, was it 9, 38? Uh, Jesus said, pray that the Lord of the harvest would send out laborers into the harvest field. So he coupled right there intercession with evangelism. Like you have to pray first that the Lord's going to raise them up. And then prayer is essentially evangelism, right? Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 He'd been praying and giving alms to the poor and just doing his ministry. And an angel of God came to him and said, your prayers have went up as a memorial unto God. So he didn't know that by praying and feeding the poor that he was building a memorial to God in the spirit. And God was watching it being built. Right? But Jesus said in the beginning, you have to pray. And then the Lord, you know, send out harvest uh, laborers. And prayer, you know, it... We do a, a 21 days of uh, fasting and prayer at the beginning of January with the ministry. You know, prayer and fasting, it softens your heart. It really does. The first thing prayer teaches you about is you. It will show you exactly where you are with God. It will show you exactly where your strength at is in the spirit. It will show you how strong you are. Because when you start to pray, and then you run out of things to say, and you have to listen to him, mm-hmm. then you see where you are, right? So compassion is, is being built. Then the grace and the mercy aspect. Like when I go to pray, like you can say, Blake, when you pray for my mom or something, I pray for your mom. But then when the Lord gives you a word to come into a season of prayer, and you have to sit with him to learn prayer, to hear from him in prayer, it softens your heart because then you have that understanding for grace and mercy. Like, man, I really, I need you, Lord. Like, you think about Moses, man. God called Moses to come up on the mountain, right? Everybody read that? Mm-hmm. What mountain did he go up on? Sinai. Sinai, right? So he goes up. I'm talking about prayer here and waiting on the Lord and let him build compassion in your heart. Imagine being Moses. So God speaks to Moses, says, in the morning, I want you to come up, right? Bring some tablets with you. You're going to write on them. Like, he didn't go down to, like, the rock quarry or, like, Alabama Rock and get some tablets, some some creek stone, some Tennessee creek stone that was already cut out. Right? No, he had, now he's got to go make the tablets. Right? I'm thinking, I'm watching Moses in the middle of the night out there with like this hammer or whatever he had and he's rocking out tablets. <laughs> so he's working through the night. Then he's got to go up the mountain with the tablets he's made and when he gets there he's got to make a fire. So now he's got to, there wasn't like a Home Depot or like a, a dude with a 1987 1500 over there that cut down logs. Like, yeah. Now he's got to cut a tree down, make the firewood. So he's going through all this work. He's heard from God. All he heard was come up. So then he starts preparing his heart. Like, I got to go up now. And finally he gets up there. He's got the tablets. He's got the wood. And then the Bible says God don't speak to him for seven days. I would have came back down the mountain. Like at the seventh hour, yeah, I'd have been on the way back down. Like, man, y'all need to, we need to pray, bro. We need to pray for confirmation. Yeah, yeah. I thought I heard from him, man, but the enemy done deceived me, and I wasted time. That's what it was. The enemy wanted me to waste time. You know, you know how we get. You know how we get. But God calls him up there, y'all, and he, and he makes him wait for seven days. And for some, somehow, some way, Moses knows to wait. Right. And then God speaks to him on the seventh day. And I always looked at that like. In, in intercession and in prayer, like God will give you a word to come close, and then he makes you wait. Because he knows in the waiting, there's stuff being knocked off of you that wouldn't be knocked off if you didn't wait. Like it's hard to, you know, be still and know that I'm God. It, and, and yeah. It's hard to hear God when you're always running. Like he'll speak to you in the gas station buying your Red Bull. You know, he'll speak to you. He'll speak to you uh, in the shop. But there's a different voice that comes when he says, okay, all right, Moses, you come up and then you sat here for seven days. 
know you had a word for me to come close, and God gives him, like, literally the Old Testament, the law. You know, 460, 30, 430, 460 something uh, laws. And so, prayer. If you've never went that place in a season of prayer with God, like, I just encourage you to do it because it will soften your heart. It will give you into compassion for others. Because he's going to deal with you on things that you've been running with the whole time that you didn't know were there. They may not be bad things. It ain't like, I'm not talking about like strongholds of like stuff that's bad, but just little areas of your character that he wants to smooth out, little crooked ways that he wants to make straight, little mountains that he wants to bring down, little valleys that he wants to lift up. The first thing I learned, the first person I learned about, in po the first person God spoke to me about in prayer when I went into seasons of prayer was always me. You know, he would always speak to me about me, like no matter what I brought before him. Because after I brought my thing before him that I needed answers for, well, I said it, I released it in faith, but then I still know in my spirit that he wants me to sit with him longer. Then he starts dealing with me about me. Not bad things, but just, you know. So set your clock. You guys do this in the morning. Uh, but it's really more just a heart, heart posture because in those seasons, God, he builds compassion. And Jesus did outreach evangelism through compassion. Matthew 14, 14, uh, it says that Jesus was moved with compassion when he saw the multitudes without a shepherd. Like his, his what, what caused Jesus to come on the scene wasn't necessarily even, uh, what's the, he came, to he came to save sinners, but his motive, like his, the emotion that was, it was birthed out of was always compassion. Like, do you see people on a day-to-day -day basis that you have compassion on? Like, I see people on the road that have road rage all the time, and I have compassion on them. Like, I, I want to I wanna, I wanna pull up to the next red light. Hopefully, it's one of those long red lights. Just knock on the door, and when they roll the window down and they're just ticked off, I, I somehow get a hug. Somehow just be like, man, you just need to fix me up, man. You know, it's, it's, you just like, man, just... Get up in that rib cage somewhere and hug you, man. Just let you know it's, it's okay, man. That lady had no idea. She, had, she didn't even see you back there, bro. You know what I mean? Feel like something you your past. Just I know. compassion. All you need is love, man. Because compassion disarms it. It just it, it tears down everything, especially anger, right? Jesus was moved with compassion. He would see him without a shepherd. You know, we see people all the time and. They're, they're fatherless or they're motherless or they're mentorless or they're young cats just trying to figure life out on their own and all they need is like compassion. Like you guys do a good job of that. Obviously Josh has got a, just a, a gift of compassion. Just look, he's giving his whole life. Chris, you know, Van, they're giving their whole life to, you know, and you guys. Like Vernon and, 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 and Lifehouse people, just compassion. Yeah. That's what, that's what, that's what tears it down. Like when I got saved in prison, man, I remember the brothers, they handled me with compassion, but they all they also called me on my stuff. Yeah. But I knew it was done out of compassion, so therefore it, it disarmed any kind of like cobra pride that would try to raise up in me to be like, no. You know, like y'all just I remember one day I was late to the uh, chapel and I was on the weight pile. Mm -hmm. You guys been in prison, you know the weight pile is like holy ground. <laughs> You don't always get that luxury, so you got to get it in while you can. And I was on—I was supposed to be in the chapel at 9:15, but I was on the wait pile because the chapel wasn't open yet. And I thought, well, I have a reason to be late because the chapel ain't open. Like I'm looking at it, it's closed, so I can hit the weights, right? And then little Jamie Faulkner, he comes out there and walks up in the middle of all the guys that are working out. He's like—he's like 110 pound teeny, just <laughs> little, but like hundred and he's walking up in the middle like us guys like us that will be out there you know pushing 315 and deadlifting 500 on call and, and he walks up to me and he says uh he says you're what's up man you supposed to be in the chapel with us and I was like man it ain't open man I was coming it's like 9 30 I'll be there man and he said no nah, bro you're double-minded man you're unstable. <laughs> you're unstable in all your ways bro yep. I've been saved for like two weeks <laughs> and I'm in the midst of like dudes that's done 20, 30 years. Yeah. Big boys, you know, they nicks like a like that cat. <laughs> and he's standing there. But something about him saying that to me in the authority of the Holy Ghost, I knew I was wrong. But his compassion of like wanting to lead me out of that type of life. 
is why I responded. You know what I mean? And I, I put the weights down and beeline to the chapel. But it's always going to be with compassion. Prayer softens the heart. Fasting softens the heart because we understand grace and mercy because we see how weak we really are. And then that allows us to have compassion on all people. All people. Like, think about, think about somebody that when you see their type, you automatically have this anger comes up, judgment comes up. You don't even want to minister to that type of person. You're like, Lord, I'm just like, somebody else present the gospel to them. But I don't even like that. You know, the internet <coughs> helps you a lot to not like people. Amen. If you're Democrat, it's Republican. If you're if you're Jesus is my savior, Trump is my president, then you don't like Democrats, right? It might be the LBGTQ community. It might be All Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, right? Everybody in this room, maybe not everybody, but some of us have some type of people that are coming to our mind right now and we're going, we don't like that person. Is there honesty in the house? <laughs> okay. All they are, this is compassion, and this helps you in ministry. If they're not following the Lord, and you are, because we're saved, and we're holy, and we're sanctified, all they are is you before you met him. That's all they are. Transgender people come in to take the city. You know, I don't, one part of me wants me to throw them in the prayer room. You know? <laughs> and the other part goes, that's just Blake 10 years ago. That's your loss. That's all that is, Blake. That's Blake 10 years ago. And I'm thankful somebody loved me. Amen. I'm thankful them boys had compassion on me and didn't throw me out with bathwater mm -hmm. after I'd been saved. And then I walked up to the table about a month later and told them they was all a cult. And I, they playing mind games on me. And I ain't saved. This is all a lie. <laughs> Imagine one of the boys coming to the house tonight and doing that. Bucking. This is a cult. Y'all done tricked me and brainwashed me with this Christian <laughs> thing, man. Uh -huh. I did that to the, to the men that were raising me in the Lord. <laughs> They were like, mm. yeah. and they looked at me and said, man, if you're going to sit down, <laughs> I'm standing there with my Bible, y'all walking away. Like, man, I they were like, how you feeling today? I was like, man, I don't know. I'm feeling crazy right now. <laughs> I think y'all, this is calm, man. Something's going on. And they were like, man, if you're going to sit down, it's evidence of your salvation right there that you're even talking like that. Sit down. <laughs> but they love me, man. And so compassion and outreach helps you, like, Paul talks about the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. The love of God, you know, which is not uh, conditional. Like he loves, man. Mm -hmm. I always think about people like Osama bin Laden, Adolf Hitler, yeah. you know, Judas. Like, think of the most, the, 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 the uh, Dahmer, Jeffrey Dahmer. You know, like the most, the people that you just go, man, they shouldn't even been born. Like the, the cross was still for them. All the way up until their death, the blood of Jesus was still speaking favorably for them in front of the Father. Still interceding. Paul, murderer, the blood was interceding before just phew, compassion, man, grace, mercy. And then when we had that kind of love, when we have Calvary type love shed abroad in our hearts through prayer and then understanding our own need for grace and mercy. It makes loving people so easy, man. It makes it makes it makes diffusing arguments and tension so easy. It makes being able to look like like I was gonna use Brandon as an example, but we're pretty we usually have the same thoughts or close to the same thoughts. But like somebody you work with and they're just totally opposite. You wanna you wanna you wanna dig out that 10 feet with the sharpshooter, they're like, no, we need to go rent a trencher. And you're like, bro, it's 10 feet. By the time you go get the trencher, it's done. So just get it done. You know what I mean? Like, I've worked, I've been in the field before. You know, Bobby would have been like, let's just dig it out. And Sam would have been like, bro, let's get a trencher. But it allows you compassion and the love of God allows you even to go in that moment. I'm not going to get upset. You know, just the love of God shed abroad. Because you see your brother maybe in his weakness, or you understand your weakness, and you go, I'm not going to let, this This is uh, compassion. Yeah. Ministry, the, when you're tired, you go home, and the family's crazy, and the, and, and the kids are everywhere, and or something didn't go your way, compassion, grace, mercy, always, it diffuses. Uh, 
Why do we have compassion like Jesus? The number one thing I recognize in, in my life, uh, and, and I'm sure you'll, you'll bear witness with this, is we see injustice clear. It's easy for us to see injustice as we spend time with the Lord. Like, in, like the, the psalm says the foundation of his throne is righteousness and justice. Like God himself sits on justice, righteousness. So when we see injustice at the hands of the enemy or the system or whatever it may be playing out in the lives of people, compassion flows up in us. This brotherly uh, affection, this, this, this unconditional love like God says, you know what, I want to I cover their shame. I want to protect, right, from the accuser of the brethren. You know, when we see, like, homeless people, they're all around Take the City. They're all around, like, Kim, you know, or Skrill. And, man, their life, yes, they've made bad decisions, right? And they need this. This is the environment they really need to be in every day. But they're not right now, right? They need to be at the center. They need to be somewhere. Prison, getting sober, to jail, whatever. But they're not. But they, what's played out in their life is injustice, right? The enemy has attacked their life. And they've made bad decisions, and now they're living under a heavy arm of, of, of oppression and depression and, and addiction. But it's all rooted in injustice. It's all rooted in at the work originally of the devil, right? And so then we see that, and then compassion stands up, and it, 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 we see the injustice, and we're like, man, we need to do something. That's why we give our life to ministry. <laughs> we don't give our life to ministry for the money. <laughs> like if you're thinking about ministry but you like money keep doing what you're doing now <laughs> that's not the case in every case because like you know Kenneth Copeland balling <laughs> but we don't do it we do it because of injustice like we pray because we want answers we pray because we want the counsel of God to be able to be the solution to the world's problem because injustice because we see that we stood in the courtroom of God one day and Jesus said, even though he's guilty as charged, put it on me. He took the injustice, made us right with God, so now we're the righteousness of God in Christ. And so therefore we, we give our life to see other people come into the righteousness, come into the justice. When you see a, a depressed person, injustice on their life, right? A gang member, uh, a drug addict. You know, like my sister, well, I got three sisters. One of them is like, um, just always been struggling for as long as I can remember. And even though I see her, and I know the answer is the Lord. I know the answer is the gospel. But she knows that. She's heard that a thousand times. You know? But on her life, when I see her life, I get, not at her, but I get angry at the enemy. Holy indignation rises up because I know she's living in a depressed state and she does not enjoy life because of injustice at the hands of the enemy. Because the love of God, the, the holiness of God is in us. So that you take that and you couple that with outreach, and outreach is easy. Now I'm going to touch on the end right here. We got five minutes. Uh, the injustice also. So how many of you say, like, you talk, you think about people that you see and you're like, I'm not like them. I, I, even though I'm a Christian, I really don't like them. You know, John said, how can you love a God that you cannot see and hate your brother that you do see? Right? Naturally, hanging out with God, you're going to be for people. All people. Because he is. Because he is. Right? Just another little, little tidbit here. It's, it's impossible to love a God that you cannot see and hate your brother that you do see. <laughs> Right. Now, that's the place. This is a threshold you walk over, man. When you get to where you really do love all people, no matter their political stance, their race, their ideology, their their whatever, their doctrine, you're like, man, we're all on a journey, and I love you. Without like When that word gets run on your heart, and it's not just a phrase, it does something to you. It changes you. But then you see the compassion of Jesus. You're like, man, I see why. Like, he... Like when I think about him dying for us while we were yet still sinners, and I think about him dying 2,000 years ago, knowing what like murders and rapists were going to do, and he still said, "I'm gonna, there's still a chance that I'm going to die for them. That, that blows my mind, man. I, I, I grapple with that. I go, man. Like, you sure the Calvinists don't have it right? There's just a select few of like the predestined ones. Like, he, like are you sure? You know, because their, their stance makes more sense in that moment, but no. 
by whomsoever shall call the name of the Lord. But I don't have that level of compassion if I'm just honest with you. Amen. Like I believe if you're honest, you would say I don't either. Amen. I don't have that level, but we're getting there. We're, you know, we're go. That's the way we're going. You know, that's the that's the that's where you're going. Yeah. To have that kind of compassion. So if you get that in your mind, like to love all people, that's where we're going. You know, and then it makes outreach easy. It makes outreach. You know, love and kindness, the outreach, our harvest days, revival in the river stuff. Just because we're just pulling up, man. Just pulling up with compassion. There's no striving. And then I'll, I'll end it with this. So we do a little something called stress-free ministry. Stress-free leadership. And you can just receive this. Uh, stress-free husbandship, brothership, whatever you want to call it. Uh, stress is, is no good. Striving is no good. There's only one place I think in the old t in the New Testament. There's a few, but the one that sticks out to me is uh, the only place we strive is to enter into His rest. That's the only place where the Bible says, "Now strive to do this." I want you to work hard to rest. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Hebrews chapter four. But um, stress-free leadership, stress-free ministry. Um, why? Because we know that God has the answer to all things, right? And so, if I'm stri if you're striving, you're in a place of like, don't know the next decision. How long should I be here? What's God calling me to do next? Stress and striving come from because you, you haven't sat down and got the answer from the Lord. You haven't got quiet long enough. Because He knows all things, right? If God knows all things and we hear from God, how do we ever stress? We shouldn't. We shouldn't. You should never stress. If God speaks and it's real that He talks and you have answers that you need or questions that you need to answer, <coughs> there should be never be any stress because he's not going to withhold, right? If he, while the Bible says if if you can give good gifts to your children, being of evil nature, how much more will your heavenly Father? Some translations say the Holy Spirit. But so God has the answers, and then stress will flow down from the head. If Josh is always walking around here stressed, you guys are going to be stressed. Amen. He's going to push the envelope harder and faster because he's on a timeline, right? If he's stressed, but if he shows fortitude and composure, you guys will look at him and be like, man, Josh ain't tripping. We shouldn't be tripping. That flows down from the head. But what happens in ministry and in walking with the Lord, we bring in a little bit of the secular world and we couple it in with our walk with him. Like, for instance, this place does have timeline. Jobs your own, they got to get done at a certain day, right? That's just reality. Right? And we'll take that mindset and that kind of feeling and we'll put it into our walk with the Lord. And it causes stress and strife. But we've got to, we've got to perform. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. But God's not judging time with you. He's looking at growth. No matter how long it takes, He's watching your growth, not how long. He's not on the clock. You know what I mean? So stress will flow down from the head. Uh, and another thing, just to help you rest and walking with the Lord, um, the gospel's been going for two thousand and twenty-three years without you. Yeah. Yeah. Without us. <laughs> it don't yeah. it don't hang on your shoulders. You can stop right now and just love him and you're good. Your reward may stop building. I'm not saying I'm not saying stop walking and trying to do ministry because you're good. That's kinda like fire insurance. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because you can't do that. Because if you truly keep walking with him, you're truly gonna want to keep yeah. be in the hands of people. Want to, right? Because you want to. <laughs> right. right. But, yeah. like, we've done our due diligence for revival on the river. My goodness, man. If there's a time card in heaven, that thing is full. Punch. It's punched. punch. <laughs> so what do we look like going into Friday? Like, man, I hope, oh, I hope a lot of people come. Man, <laughs> man I hope God just give me a word. I hope it's fire. God, I hope thousands of people get saved, Lord. And when it don't happen, I feel like a failure. Or we feel like a failure because 500 people come. No. The gospel's been going, man. It doesn't hinge on how we perform. You know what I mean? So without us, we're just doing our part. If you look at it like that, like Vernon, you're just doing your part, man. You're coming to work every day. You're providing for your family, Amber, and, and, and then other people. You're living in a Take the City Lifehouse. You're doing your part to reach a community. You're doing what you can do, bro. Yeah. 
You only do what killing. you can do. Killing and, and killing it. <laughs> yeah. Tyler, you're doing what you can do, bro. Yeah. You're working. You gonna work today? You gonna put a tool in your hand? Then you gonna go home and do what? Okay. Chris is coming to work every day, raising a family, doing ministry. Van, the same thing. Josh, the same thing. Me, the same. You guys, you're doing your part, man. No stress. I'm telling you, God's not a hard taskmaster. He ain't like that. He's not like the sergeant at the back gate. He's not like a bad boss. He's, so you can let it go. He's not a hard taskmaster. Stress-free. Now, do your part, but if I'm just doing my part, then I'm okay. If Brandon just does his part, and Blake just does his part, then we're moving the needle some. But striving, man, and stress, it's it's no good. Paul told Timothy, and I think chapter 4 of 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy, he said, the minister of the Lord shall not strive. Some translations say shall not quarrel amongst each other. Because striving is quarreling. If me and Tyler are in an argument, we're striving, right? We're quarreling. And then that's going to release everywhere that we go. People are going to see, man, they're, they're stressed out. We just, we release it, man. I love, I, I, I maintain righteousness walking through life. That's really all I can do. Right? I buffet my flesh every day. You know, I lay this whole thing on the altar. I try not to give, like King David said, anything that don't cost me nothing to the Lord. King David said, I won't give him anything that didn't cost me something. Obedience costs something. <laughs> Obedience yeah. sucks. Jesus said he. The Bible said that Jesus learned uh, obedience through the things which he suffered. Suffering the flesh. Paul said, "I buffet this thing every day." Paul put his body up and beat it. Buffet this thing. Right. That's all I can do is maintain righteousness and walk with the Lord. Everything else he's got. Amen. Amen. Don't let, the, don't let success be determined by like what you're doing for God. Let your success be determined by your devotional life with God. Because what God sees you do in secret, he'll reward over. You spend time with the Lord, loving him, loving people. You have a good thought. Like you have a forethought before you get in that van today. Nothing today is going to let me get offended. Because so when offense presents itself, you'll remember that prayer that you said. Nothing's going to... You hit it right there. Right, right. All right. Love you guys, man. Amen. Period. Two words. Two words. Do you have any other instructions for um, the event? Who's working the table with Pat? Who's, who else is working the table with Pat? I think Tyler said he was. Yeah. Vernon said he was. Hey, brother, hey, me and Pat. Oh, that's a perfect crew right here, brother. So you, you have a... You do have a shirt there. I know you haven't got it. So if you don't have a, you got it. Okay. Yeah, got his uh, y'all have a table. Y'all are the only other person <laughs> beside us that has a table. Um, table, 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 yeah, table, yeah, yeah, table. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Yeah, but it's yeah. going. There's the able table. <laughs> so bring all your stuff. Anything that you want to get out there. Pamphlets. Uh, anything that you can think. Bring it. Um, and when you get there, Stephanie and Catherine will show you where to put it. It's it's right up there by the gate to the left of the concession stand. So you you probably want to. I got you a medium pad. Medium pad. I was about to push a plug in there. You probably want to get with uh, maybe Van and because, you know, because the, the goal would be for us to, if somebody needed some help, yeah, yeah. that would be our, we're not really out there asking for money or nothing like right. that. Our goal would be to, hey, you need some help. Yeah. 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 Okay. And also, when at the AM, when we do the, the gospel and the altar call, and all the people come or they respond, that'd probably be a moment too. You can be down there. You can be down there. Have the guys down there. Because I'll do a, I don't know exactly what the, how the Lord's going to have it walked out, but I know I'm going to hit on addiction. I'm going to hit on life controlling stuff, depression, whatever. And if you're down there, you guys are down there and you see those people, yeah. then approach and be like, hey, and yeah. we'll. We'll announce mention it from the stage that you guys are up there yeah, yeah. and that this is what you guys do. Go check out their table. Yeah. Help or your family member. Right. So we've tried to not like fill it with Christians. Right. You know, I mean, there are going to be a lot of them there, but we've tried our best to get all kind of people there. So we're going to have lanyards this year? Yeah. Um, we don't know how many. Okay. So we, 
we raised raised a pretty good bit for it, but then we had some other expenses, and so I'm like a, <laughs> I'm not a, a I'm not a tight guy. I'm not a tight one, but I've been, been axing out. Come on, bro. Like, no, we're not getting lemonade. <laughs> no, no chips with their sandwich. They should be fasting. <laughs> so I don't know how many lanyards we have. Yeah, he's on. Hey, listen, need a lanyard. He's good. You're right. You're in that like, stadium. We don't, we don't get no <laughs> yeah. We don't get no waffle fried chips with a sandwich or something. You might. Oh, oh man. There might be something that come out of that. That's it. Hey, pray that it don't <laughs> rain, man. That's one thing. It's not going to rain. Yeah. Praise yeah. the Lord. Yeah. Praise yeah. the Lord. Yeah. Is little Timmy here? Yeah, he already took off. Did you pray out of his plate? Yes, sir. Let's pray.